Hello and welcome. There is one song in my life that I hear more than all others, and that is, of course, the theme to NPR's All Things Considered. And if you, like me, have ever sung along or hummed along, you're doing it right now, right? <laughs> to that theme, then you are part of the legacy of Don Vagley and Wisconsin Public Broadcasting. Don Vagley was a longtime member of the staff at WHA Radio and at the UW-Madison. He served as radio music director in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and among the pieces of music that he composed right here was the theme to All Things Considered. So millions of people who listen to public radio every afternoon hear music that was composed on this campus right here in Wisconsin. But that piece of music is only the beginning of Don Vagley's story. And today, we get to hear the whole story from two people who know it well. First, we'll hear from Jim Vagley, who is a Madison native and is one of Don Vagley's sons. He is a, a graduate of the UW-Madison with both a bachelor's and a law degree and has, for the last few years, discovered that many of his father's pieces of music have been lost or uh, have gone missing. So he has spent the last few years putting those pieces of music back together, trying to organize them, collect them, and preserve them for a new collection at the UW-Madison Archives. And he has helped put together a new set of, a new collection of that music. He's also been practicing law for the last 30 years. 15 of the most recent years have been as in-house counsel at the 3M Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. Today, we'll also hear from David Null, who has been with the General Library System since 1994 and has been director of the UW-Madison Archives since 2002. The UW-Madison Archives are the official repository for UW Extension, and so therefore they have extensive holdings of the archives of Wisconsin Public Radio and television. So please join me now in welcoming Jim Vagley. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today and talk about my father and his music. And at the end of our program, we're going to hear maybe about a minute of him playing piano right here in the Philo Buck studio in 1980, the last time he would have recorded in the studio, maybe on that piano that's back there, which was part of a collection of piano pieces distributed to public broadcasting uh, stations, TV and radio, to be film music as part of his electrosonic studio. He was one other time on the Michael Feldman show. Bless Michael's, uh, Michael for having him on. Um, and he really enjoyed jamming with the group. And we have that recording as well. So he probably was in the studio one more time. But um, thank you. David Null is here. And I just want to, from the top, thank him for being so welcoming when we first approached him about doing a collection. Uh, David has been a guiding light in this whole project and has been so helpful throughout it. And um, we're still digitizing some things. I'm doing that up in the Twin Cities. And I'll tell you just quickly a little about that in a minute. But I want to also thank Mike Crane the, from Wisconsin Public Radio and John Miskowski from Wisconsin Public Television. Did I get that wrong? Radio and television. Um, um, both for being very welcoming and helpful as well. But I would be remiss not to mention um, Danny Henry at the Pavic Museum of Broadcasting in St. Louis Park, uh, Minnesota. And if you ever get a chance, go see this museum. It's one of uh, just a few of them in the world. They have uh, broadcasting equipment from all eras, radio and television. They go back to wireless. Um, they actually have a small version of the, the uh, um, Morse code transmitter that was on the Titanic. And wait till you see that fired up. It's, um, they have everything there, and, and they are the place that I went to to get most of the digitization done and a lot of the work. Um, but David will talk more about that. And, and, and we really had, this was a search and rescue effort where we had to find what recordings existed and then do major um, post-digitization processing to try to improve the sound, get rid of pops and clicks from records and so on. In addition, um, Laura Schnitker, who's the acting curator of the University of Maryland Archives, helped us. They're the repository for National Public Radio um, air check tapes. So we got some of the interviews that he was, uh, that Susan Stamberg and others did um, 
uh, on NPR from them. And finally, um, we're hopeful that in a few weeks, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting will have three MP3 files of the public broadcasting materials. We have a mixture here in the collection, some commercial uh, work as well. But those will be available, hopefully, and you can download those and listen online. So let me tell you about my father. That's my role today. And uh, then David will speak when I'm done here. Um, my father was on campus as staff or faculty for 41 years. He was a, an undergrad here as well, and starting in his sophomore year for three years, volunteered at WHA. Now, by the way, of course, WHA back then was what you referred to. You didn't refer to Wisconsin Public Radio. It's before the public was around the Public Broadcasting Act. It eventually was Wisconsin Educational Radio Network. But today, I'll just refer to WHA to be historically correct, because that's what you used to refer to it. But he did volunteer for three years as a student, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And then for five years before that, he came to uh, music summer camp. He started in eighth grade and played um, uh, in the marimba band. So if you take those years, that means 50 years on campus. And then in retirement, he volunteered in several ways, uh, most notably playing the piano at the atrium of the university hospital and clinics to welcome patients and visitors. So he was around a long time. He loved the university, and he loved WHA. It was a very tight-knit family. And my sister Julie is here, and Kelly, my niece, thank you for coming. Um, and Julie will remember, too, that we grew up um, coming to the station, getting to know many of the people, the old timers. It was very much a family, very tight family environment. So this is a photo probably around the time he was uh, a high school senior, we believe 1937. Um, he was born in Monticello in 1920 in southwestern Wisconsin, the only child of my grandparents. And my grandmother taught in a one-room school um, and um, also knew piano. And my grandfather, who ran a hardware store that they lived above, he was a very good violinist, and, um, or a good fiddle player. You called it fiddle back then, I guess. And um, probably they're the reason he took to music. He learned keyboards, or how to play piano. And of course, keyboards was his main thing through his life. But at this point, he really loved pay playing the vibes, the xylophone. Um, he was somehow known in eighth grade. They were only 30 miles away from campus. And they needed more people on the marimba band that they were starting. So he was asked to come in eighth grade and then through high school participated in the summer music camp. And about the time of this photo, when he was a senior, um, he had a moment of youthful fame. The conductor for the marimba a concert to showcase what they had done during the whole season couldn't get back to Madison in time to conduct that concert. It was at the old Parkway Theater. And about noon that day, a call came in saying that he, my father would have to stand in as the conductor, not just as a player. It went well, well enough that the next day the newspapers reported it. And as a result of that and maybe other things, he was given one of the first scholarships given out by the university, and it was in 1937, this is during the Depression, of course, um, that allowed him to come to campus and attend the School of Music. So he started to volunteer a sophomore year. He uh, had a nine-piece, led a nine-piece National Youth Orchestra, administration orchestra that played for WHA productions. He played interstitials on the pipe organ in Studio A, which interstitials means the filler um, to bring things to the top of the hour. And he sometimes actually filled in running the board in master control if there was a shortage. He also um, participated in the Play Circle Time uh, weekly variety show that came from Play Circle Theater at the Memorial Union. And this photo, we think, is linked to that. This is probably about 1941. John Dietrich is pictured um, wearing the hat, the second from left. He was a professor, and he went on to become provost of Michigan State University, and he was a lifelong friend of my father's. And also pictured um, on the right is Richard Church, Professor Richard Church. And here's a photo of him, uh, 1943. 
1942, he graduated. He was hired as a staff musician. And the next year, he was um, promoted to music director, the position he held till 1964. Now, he taught briefly for a few years a course called Music and Radio. And so during that period, he had a joint appointment with the School of Music and the Communication Arts Department. But he also, um, it's important to know, he kind of had a technical career. Tom, I think you know about this, that he, he not only did music, but he was really a good recording engineer. And Ken Ost, who was WHA's lead attorney at the time, had my father go with him to be the engineer for UW athletic events. And Ken, and I even remember this story, but it's in Randall Davidson's book as well, used to love the story of what happened the night before a Purdue-Wisconsin game. They were having a press banquet, and it was kind of dragging on, nothing too exciting. And my father saw a piano in the corner, went over and started to play it. And soon he had a bunch of people around the piano singing with him. And this went on for hours until finally one of the Purdue coaches went up to Ken and said, we'll trade you right now a linebacker and defensive end for that piano player. <laughs> so um, he went on to be operations and facilities manager from 64 to 67. And I don't know what that really entailed, except it probably had to do with making sure the station ran smoothly and that the recording, and that they were trying to probably advance recording techniques, et cetera. And then, um, 67 to 1970, he had a special assignment to help plan the building of Vilas Hall. So he was involved with the layout that, that we have here today in this building and the studios, um, which at that time worked well. I hope they still are. I don't know. I haven't been here in a long time, and I, but um, that was part of his role as well. Here he is in 1949 playing that pipe organ in Studio B, he had a program that was daily show called Organ Melodies, and he'd play standard pieces, and then he'd improvise something at the end. As you probably know, a rich part of the history of Wisconsin broadcasting, particularly, or actually for both radio and television, was the Wisconsin School of the Air, and then there was also the Wisconsin College of the Air. Here's a picture from, I don't actually know the date of this, David, but um, this is Norm Clayton um, doing the program Let's Sing, and he um, did a bunch of songs for that series that was on 15 years from 1960 to 1974. Um, but and here's a sound clip of a song called Beautiful and Lovely, which was written for kids, and is, we also chose for the title of our compilation CD. That was in 1964. This is 1966. He did a bunch of the themes for the show, and it would change every couple years. This is from 1966, the program's theme. Let's sing, let's make the rafters ring with songs, both sad and gay. Let's sing, let's hear the melody, bring out the harmony to interplay. Let's sing. Let's learn a song or two. Let's sing a song that's new. Begin. Let's all get in the swing. Let's sing, let's sing, let's sing. So you 
might be interested to know that was beamed into the schools and the purpose of Wisconsin School of the Air was kind of to equalize teaching through the state for small schools that couldn't afford to have a lot of different curriculum. Uh, and anyhow, that was beamed in uh, at 1.30 in the afternoon on Wednesdays and that program was as popular among adults as it was kids. So they had a big listenership when they checked into it. Here he is with Claire Kensler in the background and Carl Schmidt in the foreground, probably again doing a Wisconsin School of the Year production. And I rem you know, remember them both very well and Claire was really sweet, a really sweet person. And um, I'm so delighted that they've named one of the conference rooms, uh, Jim Collins and Claire Kensler room, that's great. Um, here's the sound, the, the part of the theme for a program that was Wisconsin School of the Air, very popular. It was 1956 when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered just a year or two earlier with Professor Mansour. It was a 13-part series that was so popular it was distributed across the United States by the National, um, national I can't remember now, educational something, uh, I can't remember the name, I'm sorry. Um, but there was a, a body that used to distribute some of the better series. And um, in any event, this was being requested even in 1965, and this is that theme. Most of his themes were more upbeat than that, but that's more serious. So it was the National Association of Educational Broadcasters, so it comes to mind. And that was a precursor to NPR or anything. It was one of the ways programs got distributed. Um, here's a picture of him in the master control room at Radio Hall with Studio C in the background. But I'm going to play, I didn't have any better graphic to show you, but because we have television here, I want you to know he did quite a few things for um, Wisconsin Public Television and WHA-TV. For example, um, on our compilation CD, we have five of the songs for the Communicators in 1963 production with, among other singers, Linda Clauder. And then he did a theme for a Friday night weekly news magazine called Mosaic, which was 1962. Now, what I'm going to play for you were um, two math teaching themes. Um, we presume that these are for patterns in arithmetic and patterns in mathematics, which both debuted in 1961. The first title was for um, younger kids and the older, the, the mathematics series was for older kids. In 1964, it appears they merged and they came out with just one program, Patterns in Arithmetic, which was then for grades one through six. In any event, this was so popular that by 1972, there were 336 15 minute episodes being aired uh, or shown in classrooms in 35 states. So this is the first of those two themes. <laughs> be cheerier than the last theme we played, Dead, you know, because it was trying to get kids not to freak out doing math. David and I were laughing this morning when we did a dry run, and we thought, God, it sounds like some, you know, game show on TV. Um, so this is the second theme.
I might have even been willing to learn my math tables. Um, <laughs> at least I would have tried. Um, he did other things on campus from 1941 to at least 1951. He had a, the Don Vagley Orchestra. And Jim Gill's here, and your parents, remember your parents went and danced to them playing, Jim. I remember that. Um, here's a full picture of the ensemble when it was after World War II, and they had 15-piece band and a singer. And th we have a wonderful recording, um, the only recording in existence, and it's about seven songs that is from 1949. And that's in the collection. And here is a slide showing um, that he did a lot of work for Harris Foot. He was the music director for quite a few seasons of Harris Foot. Now, Harris Foot was similar to Hasty Pudding Club at Harvard. It was all the roles were played by men, and it was an annual production. And this is for good for the girls. So what happened here is Bill Harley, who became a legendary person in public broadcasting, helped found PBS, NPR. Um, a, a big name in public broadcasting after leaving the, United, leaving, um, the campus here. Um, he and um, Al Beaumont wrote the book or the story the last month before the competi competition deadline. And my father helped them do the lyrics. So the three of them have a credit for the lyrics. And then my father had only a few weeks to write all the music. This, we have the, uh, from acetate transcription discs, <clears throat> we have the music from this production, 22 different musical tracks as part of the collection from 1950. And um, anyhow, they won the competition. John Dietrich, who you saw pictured earlier, was the director. And it toured in a number of states, um, Illinois and Wisconsin, and I don't know if it ever went to Minnesota, I, but I know it was down in Chicago and Illinois, um, and it was a big deal back then. Um, so he participated in that as well. So between, um, for two years that spanned 1957 to 1959, he took a leave of absence, a sabbatical, because he had the opportunity to write commercial music. Um, somehow the w J. Walter Thompson um, ad agency out of Chicago heard about him, and he was asked to submit a jingle for the 1956 Schlitz Beer National Campaign and his jingle was selected. I think they had three finalists and his was selected. So in 1957, he did another jingle, and um, this was significant because Schlitz was sponsoring Playhouse of the Stars on CBS. So these jingles were heard on television once a week and on radio. This is an a the actual photo of the recording session of the second Schlitz beer jingle from 1957. Move up to quality. Move up to Schlitz. Here's how to get refreshing lightness, flavor, quality, modern taste. Move up to Schlitz. Light, light Schlitz. You owe it to yourself to enjoy the best. Schlitz is one of the finer things of life that everybody can afford. Move up to quality. Move up to Schlitz, world's best seller at any price. The beer that made Milwaukee famous, have a glass. You will get the kiss of the hops in every glass. Ask for the beer that's so refreshing. Flavor, quality, modern taste. Move up to Schlitz. Up, 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 move up to Schlitz. So this is recorded in at Universal Recording in Chicago. This is Studio A. And um, a lot of big things were recorded there, but this was really where most of the jingles in that era were recorded. In Chicago was the hub to um, jingle recording, and that's my father conducting and Jamie Silva, who is the singer, a wonderful, very famous singer for jingles, and she was part of the Jays with Jamie, which you're going to hear next. Here's a... 1959, uh, Continental was one of the first airlines to take delivery of the brand new 707. And here's the jingle with the Jays with Jamie. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. What a wonderful flight when you travel as guest on the most experienced jet line in the West. Golden Jet's the way, the way to fly. It's time to try Continental, Continental Airlines. 
And he also worked with the Singers Unlimited Bonnie Herman on many jingles as well. Here's Jamie again singing for Trailways. We think this is probably from 1960. For the easiest travel on earth, take Trailways, take a Trailways bus. For the easiest travel on earth, take an air-conditioned Trailways bus. That was actually for a television commercial, and uh, Danny up at Favic, and we edited that right down to that short clip of it. I wish I could play a lot more, but we have to, we have uh, time is fighting against us here. This is a great photo of Studio B at Universal, and I'm going to play you the jingle um, first. It's Heat with Oil. My father is in the the left um, conducting the session, actually from the control room. Mason Coppinger, who became a friend, is the engineer, and that's Jamie again singing uh, this jingle. If you want to have BTUs, a plenty then you'll choose to heat with oil. If you want to have safety and turn with the fuel that you burn, you heat with oil. If you want to have cleanliness, no muss, no mess. Modern oil heat can't be beat. If you want to live modern all the way through, I want to take just a moment to talk about how this worked. Um, my father actually didn't make a whole lot of money in his life on commercial side, and he, only, he did it for about eight years. Um, he would be paid a certain amount of money, but then he'd have to go out and hire the musicians and the, pay the recording fee, and he put a lot into it. As you can see, look at all the musicians for this one spot. By the time he was done, he often didn't make a lot. And in our history booklet, we actually talk about some of the documentation we have, how little he was paid. He was paid only $100 for the Arlene Francis show theme, the third big daily show on NBC. Now, NBC didn't pay him that little. It was a production company. And he made very little money. He had, there's a letter apologizing. He did a wonderful film score for the film Chicago City That Cares. And there's a letter saying, I'm sorry, we couldn't pay you much. We didn't budget for music. Quite frankly, musicians are often taken advantage of, and he died a, a, with a very humble estate. Luckily, he had his University of Wisconsin pension, which saved him. Now, in contrast, these wonderful musicians that are pictured, um, you know, they, by the way, I got to go as a kid to a few of these sessions. They would literally play it through once or twice, and then they're ready to record. That's how good they are. And they do this all day long. Different sessions come in. And they're so good. But they would get paid a recording fee and a royalty for as long as the jingle or commercial was on the air. So they did quite well. And it's sort of one of the ironic twists of my father. But he loved doing it. So um, no, no regrets, I'm sure. So now we're going to turn to um, a video clip. And we hope this works. We had some technical difficulties earlier. But we've taken the same commercial and put it back to back. Um, when he had to do a commercial or write for an educational film, the film was cut, and he had to score the music to the timing of the film. And so I'm going to play the first version, has just the, the visual and the music. And you can imagine, if you were writing the music, how you might have scored it, and see how you think he did. And then immediately after that, we'll go to optical sound, the real commercial, with the narration, and you'll see how it played. He did four um, commercials for Quaker Oats Company, three of them for dog food. This is from 1959. That's one well trained dog.
word about one of their many fine products, kennel meal. Does the dog in your life have a personality all his own? Does he seem to understand your moods? Is he sad when you're sad? Happy when you're happy? Does he come to you when he needs help? Does he appreciate what you do for him? Is he fond of you just because you're you? Do you feed him kennel meal? New concentrated kennel meal. When you pour on water, concentrated kennel meal bursts into meaty goodness. Looks like ground beef. For meat red kennel meal is real meat meal with meat aroma, meat flavor. Come and get it. Get protein and energy in every bite. The concentrated goodness of kennel meal. And what about the dog in your life? Is he as healthy and happy as you can make him? Do you feed him kennel meal? New concentrated kennel meal? So that probably, I, I don't know where that was shot. I'm presuming Hollywood. That dog was one heck of a well-trained dog and um, very nicely put together, I thought. But um, he did at least f um, the music for five Senko educational films. These were films from Senko Scientific Company of Chicago. So they made microscopes and laboratory equipment for high schools, colleges, and laboratories, a big name. And um, anyhow, they sponsored educational films on science matters. And this is from 1962, his, part of his film score for a film called Outer Space. <laughs> That's actually one of my favorite pieces of music of his. I just love that. Um, so back at WHA, 1970, the National Center for Audio Experimentation was founded. Here's a picture with Carl Schmidt on the left um, doing the directing of a production being taped in a station wagon, okay. and my father on the right with the tape machine recording it. And Jay Fitz, one of the, ac the actress, and I don't know the name, um, you can see it in the little, uh, I don't know the gentleman, but an actor reading the script. So in between them is Herman. That was the, the name they had for their microphone mount that my father was involved helping to design. Now the Germans actually developed binaural stereo and a lot of the rigs just had a styrofoam head with the, with the microphone sticking out. So this was a little bit of an adaptation. But the purpose here was to record it as if it was how you were hearing it if you were in that setting. And then you'd play back and listen on headphones and it's very realistic. In fact, I'm kind of surprised with all the earbuds and things that today there isn't more binaural stereo done. Of course, radio production, we don't really have plays anymore and things like this. To maybe that's part of the reason. But it's very realistic stereo and a wonderful um, thing. And um, here's a picture of him with John Tideman from the BBC and Carl Schmidt in uh, control room A at Radio Hall doing an NCAE production. We asked Carl about one year ago, Carl Schmidt wrote this for the, our project. And unfortunately, I talked with him last Christmas and said, Carl, let us send you of the part that we're duplicating, the uh, draft CDs. And he said, Jim, don't worry, I plan to be around for some time to come. And unfortunately, he died this April. But he wrote this uh, for the, our project, best friend, admired artist. We have been together professionally and personally for more than 50 years. But more than that, we have been in sync too long to split now. You are still in my vicinity, playing softly on the keyboard. We were together when your first child died, together when my first child died, when our kids were born, when we helped found NPR. We lived our lives together then and now. 
So what I want to tell you about is just again come back to the theme of how close people were who worked at WHA. They, it was like a small family. And my father had friendships with many of the people here, including Carl, a lifelong friend. In reference to the um, losing the kids, I'll just tell you my father did have a rough life. He, my parents lost their first two children, Donna from leukemia at the age of two and a half, and Bobby at the age of five while he was having a hernia repair sur surgery at UW Hospital. Somehow the, the um, anesthesia took him. And then my mother, Jean, died when I was 10 and she was 44. Um, she had been very ill for the four years preceding that. And um, so from the age of her being 40, my father had to really take on both parental roles and became, um, had to do a lot of extra duties at home. And then later, a second, another wife, Anne, died from cancer. And in addition, he suffered from ankylosing spondylitis from when he was in his 20s. Now, the onset of that is quite painful, but you've seen people who are hunched over and their spine has fused. And that's ultimately what took his life when he fell, um, in, fell and he died in 2009 um, from his back shattering. So um, this is a reference that Carl made to that. This is back to 1970, the BBC, uh, uh, someone, uh, Desmond Briscoe had come to do a seminar at WHA that people from any public station were invited to attend on sound effects. And he brought this little Putney synthesizer. There's actually two stories. He either brought it or the university bought it for that purpose. But what I always heard was he brought it, didn't want to spend the money to ship it back because he was traveling through the US. And anyhow, the university got this little Putney synthesizer. My father then went out and bought the keyboard and started to do some music for NCAE productions. And some of, on our, our collection, we have a couple of those pieces that we attribute to NCAE productions. In 1971, newly formed National Public Radio came to him and asked him to do a theme. And he used this little synthesizer and an eight track tape machine to come up with the first theme. Now mind you, both this and the Moog synthesizer, which I'll show you a little later, they were monophonic instruments. You could play a, a chord on the keyboard, but you'd only get the lowest note. So you had to layer note by note with a multi-track tape machine. The tape machine did almost all that work. You had to play one note at a time and then build a chord. You'd have three passes with the tape machine. So very labor intensive effort. And I'll tell you more about the second theme in a minute and how long that took. actually used for five years until 1976. He did a lot, he did a whole music package, so lots of buttons and bridges, and we have those. National Public Radio has gotten rid of almost all that, but luckily we found another source, and we have some of that. And um, this is just a nice um, message from Linda Wertheimer, thanking him and telling him that this is a teletype. This is how you communicated back then for all of us email and texting junkies. Um, but anyhow, this was the little theme for All Things Considered for Consumer. And I've recommended that Kevin McKinley um, for um, On Your Money use this, but it hasn't gone anywhere so far. <laughs> was done with that little Putney and um, he did a lot of these bridges and, and send whole music package buttons most of them cheery and upbeat this is one of my favorites and David I know you like this too called echoing so it's a little longer it's one minute and I think to save time I'll pr probably play you only 30 seconds this is typical of something to bridge between two pieces uh, in a new s show
and I'm just going to move on. It repeats um, to save some time here. This is the, film, the score he wrote for the second theme, the theme that is used today. So if you take both the first theme and the theme used today, that's 45 years that his uh, themes have been the signature for All Things Considered. He wrote, we believe, the bridge, um, which is a latter piece. You can't see very well on this, but he wrote the main piece on one form of uh, stationery, and he wrote the bridge later. He was very proud of the bridge. Later, in an interview with Neil Cohn on, N on NPR, some years into his retirement, he just said he was really pleased how the bridge turned out. Now, th this was originally done um, using this equipment. Oh, I got to play you. I'm sorry, I'm going to play it to you, and I'll show you the equipment in a minute. It took two and a half weeks layering up the, each note to get to this. That's a radio sig it's supposed to be a radio signal to introduce it. the bridge in one other version in a minute. You'll hear that. This is the, what the Electrosonic Studio turned into with a Moog synthesizer. Again, still only a, a, a monophonic instrument, however. So he then had a 16-track tape machine from a 10 and had to do all that layering. Again, that took two and a half weeks just to, do, to get all the notes in for that piece that he did. Um, this is a photo just before he retired in 1982. So here is an orchestral version. He then um, had others do arrangements, and this is his own last arrangement of the All Things Considered theme, and I'll play a little bit more of it. He's playing electric piano, and you'll hear the bridge that he liked so much. did um, a lot of production music. So, you know, he had the Electrosonic Studio for eight years. They came out with 26 records, 17 were of his own music, and then he had nine done by other musicians, which was sent out to public radio and television stations. This is back when copyright laws made it very expensive to use commercial music for public broadcasters. So this was part of the way to help stations do productions. And these, this music is still valid. We've, we only have half of the electronic music, the tapes, um, in existence, so we, a lot of it's been lost, but we have enough, and it's part of our, our, our new collection, and it's still available to any public broadcaster that wants to use it. Um, he did a signature for, Na for Minnesota Public Radio, he did a signature for American Public Media, and he did two that the Voice of America used as top of the hour signatures. And if you tuned in in 1974, this is what you might hear at the top of the hour to signal that it's the Voice of America. <laughs> Their theme is um, um, obviously Yankee Doodle, so you know that, and today you'll still hear them using that. This is the version from 1977. <laughs> Thank you. 
In 96 to 97 percent of all public radio and television stations used his production music during these years. So, but this was kind of a special treat that the VOA wanted to use it as well. Well, here he is probably in one of his happier moments jamming with friends. Um, to the left, just over my father, is Ralph Hansen, a dear friend of his who is an attorney in town. Uh, Ken Ost is playing drums and looks smiling, as is uh, Ralph. And then that's Bob Hummy playing clarinet. And Bob has a lot of history with Wisconsin Public Television. He created The Friendly Giant in 1958, took it to the CBC in Canada, where it aired for over two decades. He was given the highest civilian award shortly before his death and the uh, Order of Canada award. So he is known by every Canadian above the age, I'm going to guess, 40. 35 maybe even, that was rebroadcast for many years. In fact, it used to be in, um, when I went to a conference in Toronto across the, uh, the um, road was the CBC New Studios and I went in their museum. The very first thing you used to see was the set for the Friendly Giant. So they're very proud of it. Um, here he is with, um, in retirement with one of his favorite friends, Kermit the Frog. And um, he, Never, you know, despite his considerable talents, I think one of the things that I appreciate most about him is it never went to his head. He didn't come home and talk about his music. Um, I loved it, but I, I just had that interest. But Julie, I think you'll agree, he was pretty much um, silent when he came home. He just, it was his job. He had had so much adversity in his life that he um, didn't take it too seriously, but he liked doing it. And the thing, other thing that amazes me is how upbeat most of his music is, despite the kinds of tragedies that he went through. I mean, he could have, if it had been me, I don't know, I might have shut down and uh, you know, become um, not very pleasant to be around if I had had all those bad things happen to me. He was humble. Um, I was recently asked in a podcast, tell me about him, and I would say this, he was humble. Uh, David Brooks has a new book out, The Road to Character, and he talks about how today, unfortunately, we're so much the me first society, but back then, humility was a key thing that people sought to be, and he was that. He was very humble, down to earth. He was kind to people. I remember hearing many times from people how kind he was to people of all walks of life. He really believed in equality. The Southern Poverty Law Center was one of the organizations he gave money to. He loved humor, though, and this is another thing that maybe saved him from the brink with all of the tragedies. And he valued family and friends, and he had many uh, lifelong friends. Here's a picture of him uh, painted by Madison artist Dorothy Bausch um, at UW Hospital and Clinics playing the piano that I mentioned earlier. He did that in his volunteer years. So I'm going to close with one last sound clip. This is him in 1978 in the Electrosonic Studio. And what I'm playing for you is something we found and confirmed from broadcast air checks. In 1975, um, on New Year's Eve, All Things Considered closed its program playing this piece of music to wish people a happy new year. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Null from the UW-Madison Archives. I just want to say a couple of things about the archival collection that we have on Don Vagley. I first met Jim about 
three and a half years ago when he got in touch with the University Archives and the Mills Music Library and the radio station here, other people to see what we might have about his father and what we might have to that he could digitize, that we could preserve. And so he came down to Madison, we got together, we started looking at things. We had quite a bit of material, photographs of his father and also some media um, from our collections on WHA. Jim also had a lot of other things, so you can see from this slide material that he and the family donated to the University Archives that include albums, cassette tapes, other types of material, paper materials. We're continuing to add to this collection. Jim brought some more things with him today, so and we will continue to add to the collection as time goes by. Um, this all led up to the four CD set that we just came out with um, a month or so ago. There are copies of this by the door if you want to take ones when you go out. If other people want copies who are seeing this later, you can contact the UW Archives. We'd be happy to send you as many copies as you like. It's really great sound and it's got really good liner notes, extensive liner notes. Jim has spent a huge amount of time and a not insubstantial amount of money trying to make sure he has the best copies available that he could find of the music. And he spent a lot of time, as he said, with Pavic trying to make sure that they cleaned the music up, that they got the best possible versions that you could get. And that's not a cheap or easy or fast thing to do. I always say people think digitization should be fast, cheap, and easy, and it's none of those things if you do it well. Um, it also takes time and effort to preserve this, because we will preserve the MP3 files, which we will give to people or to just to play. We will preserve WAV files as high resolution files, which are often as much as 10 times the size of an MP3 file. And we'll keep the physical media also. So we'll be preserving a lot of different types of material for the collection. These are some copies. Jim's been doing versions of CDs for a long time, trying to find the best things that he could and get them done. Um, this is another example of the types of materials you deal with when you're dealing with audio. So. We had albums, we had cassette tapes, we have reel-to-reel -reel tapes in different sizes. The thing in the brown wrapper is a 16-inch transcription disc. We have 7,000 of them. Many of them are WHA recordings. Those, there's a machine at Mills Music Library that can digitize them. It's on its last legs. They ask for money to buy a new machine, a refurbished machine, which costs $6,000 to, um, we're looking at potential grant funding to digitize some of the School of the Air and College of the Air materials that we get asked for quite a bit. But you're looking at a lot of different types of material and you're looking at, you know, if some of it's easier to digitize to take care of the others. Audio tapes, sometimes they're great, sometimes they fall apart while you're running them through the machine and everybody's stopping making machines, just finding machines anymore is difficult for much of this material. So it's not a simple process to do the types of preservation that Jim's been interested in doing. Um, this is just another, I like some of the album covers that for Don's music, Again, most of these were gifts from Jim and the family. Um, and we'd like to leave you with the last clip that we're going to be doing, which um, was recorded in this studio in 1980. Um, it's called For Kim, which was Jim's daughter, Kim. And so we would like to leave you with that piece. <laughs> 